Heavenly Father, we thank you for taking us halfway through the, this particular series. And as we begin part two, we ask that you would once again guide and direct and that you'd give clarity to the presentation. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us, your angels to be with us. We ask that you would continue to bless us throughout the rest of the Sabbath day and make these truths of such a nature that your Holy Spirit can use them to inspire us to surrender our lives at the foot of the cross. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> We're now at uh, page 70 in your notes. Um, the title of this presentation is Similar Scenes. And we start by reminding ourselves that Jesus identifies himself as the first and last. And particularly, if you haven't ever cemented that principle of Christ's character in your mind, if you would start reading from Isaiah 40 to the end of the book of Isaiah, you'll see that the theme that Isaiah uses from 40 onward is the attribute of God being the first and the last the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the ending, which is the attribute in Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus points out more than any other. And in Isaiah 44, 6 through 8, it says this, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and declare it and set it in order for me? since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show unto them, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. If you look at this passage in Isaiah before and after these verses, the Lord is saying that he appointed the ancient people to illustrate the end of the world. Uh, the Tower of Babel is an illustration of how modern Babylon comes down at the end of time. Uh, the descendants of Ishmael there in Genesis are an illustration of the role of Islam in the history of the world today. Ancient Israel is an illustration of modern Israel. And if you really come to grips with one of the things that Isaiah is teaching in connection to this. The witnesses for God at the end of the world are going to proclaim the message of the hour by understanding that Christ illustrates the end from the beginning. That's part of our responsibility as witnesses, is that we're to understand the principle that the end is portrayed from the beginning. That is how we are to relate to prophetic study. So, we've looked at the history of the Millerite, illustrating the history of the development of the 144,000. And we know that in the history of the Millerites, there was a message of the hour, a message that was unsealed. And we're suggesting that the message of the hour at the end of time is the last six verses of Daniel 11. And there are a few places where Sister White comments on Daniel 11. And in my mind, the most important one is this one here. And you'll notice that Sister White has a lead-in, and then she quotes verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11, and then she has some comment on it. So she breaks into the middle of verse 30, but we're going to read this. She says, We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. What prophecy is she speaking about here? The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel, right? Now recently, we've interacted with a theologian that's a representative of the Biblical Research Institute of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, highest, highest department in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in terms of being the you know, arbitrators of correct doctrine within Adventism. Um, 
and they, they reject the conclusions that we've come to understand about the last six verses of Daniel 11. And the, the representative, uh, Gerhard Fandel, that has interacted on the subject with us, one of the things that he points out is that this passage right here that we're reading, that it isn't dealing with Daniel 11, it's dealing with Revelation 13. So it seems to me that when I ask you what this is dealing with, that you all understood that it's dealing with Daniel 11, and I want to submit to you that this is dealing with Daniel 11. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment, but some people have to change that sentence to Revelation 13, and I'm not sure exactly why. My, my personal opinion is because of a difference of understanding on the daily in the book of Daniel. But nevertheless, I want to point that out to you, that this particular passage in the spirit of prophecy is one that there's an argument, of, argument about already in Adventism. Is this dealing with Revelation 13 or is it dealing with Daniel 11? So I think it's dealing with Daniel 11. It says, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. So Sister White's talking about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11. And then she says, there is history that has already taken place in Daniel 11 that is repeated when Daniel 11 is finally fulfilled. Now, the Ellen White, the pioneers, understood that the first 39 verses of Daniel 11 had been fulfilled before the Millerite movement. So when Sister White's saying much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of Daniel 11 will be repeated, she's saying much of the history, the prophetic history, that's in the first 39 verses of Daniel 11 is history that will illustrate the final fulfillment of the last six verses of Daniel 11. That's, that's what she's saying there. And there is. When you, get, when you start looking at it, there are histories that are identified in Daniel 11. Daniel 11 begins in the time period of the Medes and Persians, tells the story of Greece and Alexander the Great. And it goes, in verse 16, it goes into the history of pagan Rome. Pagan Rome's the subject till verse 30. Verse 31, Papal Rome becomes the subject till the end of the chapter. So you have hundreds of years of history in Daniel 11 that were already fulfilled before Sister White wrote this. And she said much of that history will be repeated when Daniel 11 reaches its conclusion. In Great Controversy 356, Sister White says, the time of the end is 1798. We brought some Time of the End magazines back there, and everyone that doesn't have that magazine, feel free to take one. That quote is in there. So for a simple point of reference, you can say, you can use that passage from Ellen White to say 1798 is the time of the end. You do not have to do that. The book of Daniel all by itself identifies the time of the end as 1798. But just for a simple point of reference, the time of the end is 1798. So when you get to verse 40, it says, and at the time of the end. So you know that verse 40 begins in 1798. And verse 40 is followed by verse 41, verse 42, 43, 44, 45, and then comes Daniel 12.1. And Daniel 12.1 says this, And at that time, the phraseology of the language there is saying, And at that time, somewhere in the previous verses, that's Daniel 12.1, And at that time, it's looking backwards, And at that time, Michael still shall stand up. So we know in Daniel 12.1, when Michael stands up, human probation closes. But Daniel 12.1 says, somewhere in the previous verses, human probation closes. So verse 40 of Daniel 11 begins in 1798, and it, it goes on, verse 45, until human probation closes. There's the history that those verses are covering. And Sister White, in this passage, references the final fulfillment of Daniel 11, which would be, Verse 40, in fact, if you want to be technical, 1798, the time of the end, was before Ellen White. So you could even say, and at the time of the end, what Sister White identifies as 1798, the very first part of verse 40 was even previous to Sister White's time period. But she's talking about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11, so she's talking about the part of verse 40 that had not yet been, been fulfilled and the following verses. And speaking about those verses, she says, much of the history that's already taken place in fulfillment of Daniel 11, will be repeated. We're on page 70. And then she goes right in to verses 30 to 36. She quotes verses 30 to 36 of 11. Now, 
do me a favor. We haven't, if, you, if you're sharing over a long period of time with a group of people, you develop a little bit of rapport generally. I don't know that we're there yet, but do me a favor on this one. I'm going to ask you a question and respond. Raise your hand. How many are prepared to give a Bible study on verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11 to a non-Adventist this afternoon if you had the opportunity? Raise your hand. Now turn around and look at all the hands. See, th there's no hands up. And it's always that way. I mean, there's, uh, sometimes there's a few hands. But it's always a small minority of Seventh-day Adventists that are prepared to give a Bible study on verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11. The pioneers understood those verses. If you had to give that Bible study, all you'd have to do is grab the book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith on the way out the door and use that as your Bible study and go through because Uriah Smith is right on. And you know what Sister White says about the book Daniel and Revelation? Every Seventh-day Adventist should own that book. Why, how do I, she doesn't say it like that. What she says is we should be giving that book away to our neighbors. So we must be, be in possession of that book in order to give it away. In fact, if we're to give it away with our neighbors, we should have lots of those books. You know what she calls that book? God's Helping Hand. That's her word. And if you go to that book, he expresses the pioneer understanding of verses 30 to 31. So sister, what Sister White is saying here is much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of Daniel 11 will be repeated when Daniel 11 is finally fulfilled. But what I want you to especially see is verses 30 to 36. And she quotes verses 30 to 36. And as soon as she does, if you, on top of page 71, she says this. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. What's she speaking about? What's the subject of this spirit of prophecy quote? The subject, in my mind, is the future fulfillment of Daniel 11. She's saying that she's talking, she's not talking about the future fulfillment of Revelation 13. I am sorry if you read that into that text. It is not there. This is about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11. And the first thing she does, she says, if you want to understand this, you need to understand that history repeats. And there's histories that will be repeated that tell you what these verses are. That's what she said. Much of the histories that, that have been fulfilled in this prophecy will be repeated. But she says, I want you to especially understand that when it comes to verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11, that history, seen similar to those described in these verses, will take place. So when it comes to Daniel 11, 40 to 45, I submit to you that anyone that wants to give you a presentation on what the final fulfillment of Daniel 11 is, they're going to have to give you an understanding that parallels the history of verses 30 to 36. And that, of course, this is where Adventism, <laughs> you know, we have a pretty good understanding on Daniel 2. That's easy to share with a, a non-Adventist. We're okay on Daniel 7. Daniel 8, a little bit harder because, you know, we've got to take time to explain the sanctuary there in Daniel 8, right? A little bit more difficult. But when it comes to Daniel 11, when, we get, when we're heading into Daniel 11 with the non Adventists, you know what we do? Okay, we've finished Daniel 8. Let's go to Revelation now. Let's pass over those last three chapters because we're not too familiar with them. But we read this morning, what was that last vision about? It was for God's people in the last days. It explains what happens to God's people in the last days. It's present truth for God's people in the last days. But we don't know what it is. But the pioneers knew what it was. But it's been sealed up to our understanding. Why? Why has it been sealed up? From customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. That's what seals up the understanding of God's word. That's what Sister White said. That's what Sister White said. You read it with us. So, oh, here's the quote about... Daniel and Revelation being God's helping hand. So let me tell you, if you will, the, the pioneer understanding of these verses. Um, when I first put this together, I, I thought, okay, I'll put all the references from the book Daniel and Revelation in there. And I said, nope, I've done that before, and it's a lot of work. You need to test these things. You need to have the book by Uriah Smith, and if you don't, you need to get it because you're supposed to be handing it out to your neighbors. So you, you should have this book. If you don't, get it. And then as a student uh, of prophecy, as a Berean, 
And as a Seventh-day Adventist, at the end of the world, you have the responsibility to test the things you're hearing. You go see if I'm going to give you an accurate reflection of the pioneer position of these verses um, as represented in the book, Daniel and Revelation. The pioneers understood, brothers and sisters, that Daniel 11 began in the time period of the Medes and Persians, and very quickly in the first few verses, it gets into the history of Greece. And Alexander the Great dies, and his kingdom's divided to his four generals, and then very shortly thereafter, his four generals have turned into two generals. The general that controls Syria is called the king of the north in Daniel 11, and the general that controls Egypt is called the king of the south. And the only place you're going to find the struggle between the king of the south and the king of the north in God's word is in Daniel chapter 11. So how to identify who the king of the north and the king of the south is, if there's a way to, to have a rule to say this is the king of the north and this is the king of the south, it's going to be found in Daniel chapter 11 because that's the only place this struggle is illustrated in God's word, is in this chapter. And the pioneers came to understand that as this history unfolded in Daniel 11, the power that was controlling Syria, and at that time in history, Syria was a much larger piece of real estate than Syria today, and that part, in that time period in history, Syria included what we call Babylon. And in reality, the power that controlled Babylon was the king of the north, although in, in antiquity it was called Syria, and the power that controlled Egypt was the king of the south. And these descendants of Alexander the Great are struggling to reestablish his kingdom. Um, Alexander the Great's kingdom is the point of reference for Daniel 11, and as these, these generals war against each other to reestablish Alexander the Great's kingdom, in verse 14 you see introduced a phrase, and also the robbers of thy people, the pioneers identified the robbers of thy people as pagan Rome. This is the first time pagan Rome comes into this history. And all, they're do, all that happens in verse 14 is that they are mentioned. But in verse 16, you see pagan Rome come into this history and it begins to conquer the world. Verse 16 and 17 identify three points of conquest for pagan Rome uh, that it needed to conquer before it took control of the world supremely. Th that, those areas of conquest being Syria to the east, um, Egypt to the south, and the pleasant land, Israel. Uh, the third of these um, three geographical areas was conquered in 31 BC at one of the most, if not the most famous naval ba battle in history, the Battle of Actium. And in 31 BC, pagan Rome began to rule the world supremely for a time. This is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Daniel 11:24 says pagan Rome would rule the world for a time. What's a time in Bible prophecy? It's a year, it's 360 years. And pagan Rome, according to Daniel 8, verse 9, was going to have to conquer three geographical obstacles. In Daniel 8, verse 9, it was the east, the south, and the pleasant land. The east was Syria, the south was Egypt, the pleasant land was Israel. And in Daniel 11, verses 16 and 17, these same three geographical areas are identified. Pagan Rome conquers these three obstacles, Syria, Egypt, and Israel, the third was Egypt, and it conquered Egypt in 31 B.C. And then in fulfillment of the time prophecy of Daniel 11:24, that pagan Rome would rule the world for 360 years supremely, it ruled the world for 360 years until the year 330. And in the year 330, the emperor of Rome moved the capital of the Roman Empire from the city of Rome to Constantinople, and pagan Rome's time period to rule the world supremely came to an end. Pagan Rome had a time prophecy on how long it would rule the world. Papal Rome had a time prophecy on how long it would rule the world. What's that time prophecy? 1260 years. What was the starting point for Papal Rome to rule the world supremely for 1260 years? What started that? It's when the third geographical obstacle was overcome by the papacy, being the Goths that were driven out of Rome. Rome, Papal Rome had to conquer three geographical obstacles, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Pagan Rome had to conquer three geographical obstacles, Syria, Egypt, and Israel. When Pagan Rome conquered the third, it began to rule the world supremely for 360 years. When Papal Rome conquered the third, the Goths, it ruled the world supremely for 1260 years. When it comes to modern Rome, in verse 40 of Daniel 11, 
It first has to conquer the king of the south in verse 40. Then it has to conquer the glorious land in verse 41. And then in verse 42 and 43, it conquers Egypt. Modern Rome has three geographical areas that it needs to overcome. Why do I say three geographical areas? This is an important argument. Why do I say three geographical areas? Because upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. Pagan Rome had to overcome three geographical areas to rule the world supremely. Papal Rome had to overcome three geographical areas to rule the world supremely. Therefore, when we see the king of the south, the glorious land in Egypt, in verses 40 to 45, as the point of attack by modern Rome, you know that there are three geographic, geographical obstacles. Why is that important to understand? Important to understand. Because the argument is the glorious land. Is the glorious land the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or is the glorious land the United States of America? And I submit to you, brothers and sisters, the United States of America is a geographical area, but the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a spiritual entity. Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. It can't be the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It must be a geographical area. In D Daniel 11, in verse 16, pagan Rome begins to conquer the world. And it is the subject of the verses, according to the pioneers and Uri Smith, until verse 30. Then it does something in verse 30. The very last phrase of verse 30, and we could, we could give you the bits and pieces of these verses, but we'll develop that more as we proceed the rest of the day and tomorrow. In verse 30, the last thing that happens is it says that pagan Rome, pagan Rome is the subject of these verses, pagan Rome has intelligence with them that who forsake the Holy Covenant. In Bible prophecy, there is one power identified that forsakes the Holy Covenant. Who is that? You know what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians? That before the papacy appears, there must be what? A falling away first. There is a, a church identified in scriptures as the one that forsakes the Holy Covenant, that ha goes through the falling away, the, the time period of compromise, and the church in Bible prophecy that forsake the Holy Covenant is the Catholic Church. And at the end of verse 30, pagan Rome has intelligence, communications, interactions with the papacy. And once that happens, pagan Rome ceases to be the subject of these verses. And papal Rome is the subject from verses 31 to the end of the chapter. Um, of course, Uriah Smith doesn't believe, Uriah Smith has some misunderstandings. When he gets to verse 36, he introduces a new thought. But even Uriah Smith agrees with the pioneers that from verse 31 through verse 35, that the subject is the papacy. We'll do, deal with his misconception later. So the first thing that happens in this history, this is, this is the verses that Sister, Sister White points to. The first thing I would like you to see is that in verse 30, there's an intelligence that takes place between this power that place the papacy on the throne of the earth. History and prophecy teach that pagan Rome is the power that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. Does everyone understand that? This wasn't China that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. Pagan Rome is the power that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. And the f their first wrong move in this narrative is in verse 30 as they started having a dialogue with the Vatican had communications with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And then in verse 31, it says this, An arm shall stand on his part. Now, brothers and sisters, the pioneers correctly identify, and this is in Daniel and Revelation, the his part is the papacy. He's become the subject of the verse at this point. Now this is the papacy. The arms that stand up for the papacy is the military strength of pagan Rome. That's what Daniel 7 said. Remember Daniel 7? Pagan Rome disintegrates into ten kingdoms. And three of these kingdoms are going to have to be removed before the little horn comes up. But it's these seven European nations that use their military strength to destroy these three horns, correct? Everyone follow that? Pagan Rome's the military strength, the arms of the seven European kings stand up for the papacy. That's the first thing that verse 31 says. They stand up on his part. Then th these arms, pagan Rome, shall pollute the sanctuary of strength 
they shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So verse 31, pagan Rome has communications with the papacy. Verse, verse 30, end of verse 30. Then verse 31, the subject changes to the papacy. And what verse 31 is saying is that arms, the seven European kings, they stand up for the papacy. They pollute the sanctuary of strength. They remove the daily sacrifice and they place the papacy on the throne of the earth. And then, brothers and sisters, verses 32 and onward describe the persecution that takes place during the time period that historians call the Dark Ages, where if you look at the Protestant historians, they say that during the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church put 100 million martyrs to death. If you look at the Catholic sources, they say not so. All we martyred during the Dark Ages was 50 million. So somewhere between 50 and 100 million people were put to death during the 1260 years that the papacy ruled the world. And that is described in verses 32 through 35, the persecution. So in verse 31, we see the preliminary events that lead to the abomination of desolation being placed, 538. And that's what Uriah Smith would tell you is that the, when they place the abomination that make us desolate, that is the year 538. Now, we're not going to read these following passages. I put them in here for, for one purpose. We're going to go over them very quickly and come back to these two verses. As Adventists, we sometimes don't realize that this, one of the primary subjects of Bible prophecy is this relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome. It, all throughout Daniel and Revelation, these, there's passage after passage that is dealing with the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome. Why do you suppose that is? It's very simple, brothers and sisters. Pagan Rome placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. Who places the papacy on the throne of the earth at the end of the world, according to Revelation 13? The United States. If you're going to understand what the United States is doing in the world today, you must understand what pagan Rome did back in the time period that it placed the papacy on the throne of the earth because pagan Rome is a type of the United States. I mean, it's, that's why if, if you have the discernment that Seventh-day Adventists should have and you see the, the authors that probably know nothing about this sacred history comparing the presidency of George Bush and what he's doing in the world today with the imperialism that was taking place as the Rome built its empire way back when, you realize that these reporters are hitting on some very profound truths. But anyway, that's off the subject. Notice Daniel 7, the story of the ten horns, the three horns removed in Daniel 7, and the little horn coming up. Brothers and sisters, this is the history of how the transition between pagan Rome and papal Rome. It is the history of how pagan Rome worked to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. We've read a quote here. I told you we were going to refer to it a lot. I'm going to refer to it again. The Lord does not repeat things unless what? Unless they are important. Remember that quote? So here we're going to see that the subject of the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome is the subject of the books of Daniel and Revelation. And the books of Daniel and Revelation are the books that we're supposed to be studying. The little horn um, in Daniel 8, verses 9 through 12. This is describing the relationship of pagan Rome and papal Rome. We're going to go through these verses later on, Lord willing. Same history, taking a different line of thought, different passage. So Daniel 7 deals with it. Daniel 8 deals with it. Daniel 12, verses 11 and 12. The 1290, the 1335 is dealing with the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome. It's a, it's a parallel passage to verses 30 to 36. And Sister White says, scenes similar to those described in these verses will take place. Daniel 12, verses 11 and 12 is a parallel passage. If you get in the book of Revelation, the seven churches in Revelation, Pergamos is the time period of pagan Rome. So, so is Smyrna, but pagan Rome. Pergamos is the time period of, of pagan Rome just before the papacy is placed on the world, thrown on the earth. And when the papacy is placed on the throne of the earth, you're in the time period of Thyatira. The churches of Pergamos and Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2 is identifying the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome. In the seals, there's seven seals. The, the third seal to the fifth seal is dealing with the same history. 
different, different line of prophetic truths. The trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9. Here's two chapters in the Bible all by themselves. The pioneers correctly identified that the trumpets represent the historical forces that bring to disintegration the Roman Empire. And it's because of this disintegration into ten kingdoms that the environment is created that the papacy can rise to power. So there's no way that you can take the story of the trumpets out of the story of the story of pagan Roman papal Rome. They're part of the story. So do you realize now how many passages we're dealing with that have a direct relationship to these verses? Revelation 13, 2. It says the dragon. Revelation 12 comes before Revelation 13. In Revelation 12, there's a dragon. And what does Revelation 12 say the dragon is? Satan. And Sister White comments on this in the Great Controversy. She says the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. It is, Satan was attacking Christ at his birth and at his death, but in doing so, he was using the forces of pagan Rome to accomplish that work. So the dragon, in that sense, is an interchangeable symbol with Satan and pagan Rome. So when you come to Revelation 13, 2, which is just a continuation of Revelation 12, and it says the dragon gave the papacy its power, seat, and authority. If we had, if we could resurrect a handful of the pioneers of Adventism, a Joseph Bates, a Loughborough, and Andrews, a James White, and they were in this room right now, and we could ask them, brothers, can you give us a sermon on the power, seat, and authority? They could all stand up and give several sermons on the power, several sermons on the seat, and several sermons on the authority. And I know I'm not exaggerating. Just read their writing. It was a subject of their writings. But in Adventism today, if you ask Seventh-day Adventists today, when did pagan Rome give its authority to the papacy? When? When? 538, you said? I disagree? Not, not 330? Five, not 508? Not a trick question. This is an opportunity to point out where we're at in relation to the pioneer understanding. Pagan Rome gave its seat of authority to the papacy in the year 330 when it moved its capital from the city of Rome to Constantinople. That's the seat. Pagan Rome gave its power. What's power in Bible prophecy? Military and economic strength. It gave its power to the papacy from the year 496 until 508 and beyond. Because even in the Dark Ages, it was the military strength of the, the European kings that the papacy was exercising as it controlled the world. But the giving of the power first took place. The giving of the power is Daniel 7. The kingdom disintegrates into ten kingdoms. Three of these kingdoms need to be destroyed, the Heroli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. They have to be taken out of the way before the papacy comes up. They have to be militarily conquered before the papacy takes control of the world. And the papacy doesn't have an army, so it's going to have to use these seven armies of these seven European kings. And one by one, these kings bowed to Rome. And the first that bowed to Rome, who's the first that bowed to Rome? And if we knew this history, we'd realize some of the current events that go on today. Who's the first? Who's called the firstborn of the Catholic Church or the eldest da daughter of the Catholic Church? France. Clovis, king of France, bowed to Rome in 496. And he brought his nation into a church-state alliance with the papacy in 496 and began to do the work of removing the three horns. And one by one, every one of those seven European kings bowed to Rome. Who was the last to bow to Rome? You all know his name. Every, even, even the young boy I seen earlier probably would know his name if he's still here. Yes. If you think of the knights of the round table, when the knights used to ride the horses with the spears, who's the most famous king? King Arthur. King Arthur was the last of the seven European kings to bow to Rome. He did so in the year 508. From 496, to 508, 
the seven European kings bowed to Rome, surrendered their military strength to Rome. They did something else. You know what they did? They changed the legal profession of their countries. We're not familiar with this in the United States. But in most countries of the world today, even now, they have a legal national religion. Most of the countries in South America, their legal national religion is Catholicism. But in antiquity, every country had a national religion. In the United States, we don't have that. So it, it seems kind of, kind of unfamiliar to us sometimes. But all of these kings were pagan Rome, the, came from the pagan Roman Empire. Their legal religion was paganism. And as they bowed to Rome, they took the legal religion of paganism out of their constitution and replaced it with Catholicism. The last to do this was King Arthur in 508. And that's why the pioneers say that paganism was removed in 508 because all of those kings had legally removed the religion of paganism from the constitutions of their countries in this process. But in this time period, they gave their military power to the papacy. When did, this is the question that got this started, when did pagan Rome give its authority to the papacy? In 533, Justinian, the emperor of Rome, trying to win political support. Now, his kingdom's fallen apart. This is 533. Um, the kingdom was divided in east and west in the year 330. And after that time period, the seven trumpets of Revelation begin to blow. And the Roman Empire is crumbling. You have Oda, so you have Attila the Hun come down. And the Roman Empire is falling apart. And by the time you get to 533, there's a desperate situation going on. And the emperor of Rome is a man named Justinian. And there's an argument going on in the religious world at the same time. And the argument in the religious world is the Christian church at Constantinople the premier Christian church? Or is the Christian church in the city of Rome the premier Christian church? And Justinian... Although he's a politician, he decides he's going to enter into the religious argument. And he's going to identify that the Church of Rome is the premier church. And he, he writes out a, a, a legal document. It does two things. And brothers and sisters, when the pioneers talk about this action, they almost, uh, every time almost, when they're writing about it, they put the document in their article. They understood the significance of this document of Justinian. And in this document, it identifies the Pope of Rome as the head of the church and the corrector of heretics, which means in 533, the Pope of Rome could turn to Justinian and say, you're a heretic, off with your head. It's at this point that the authority was given to the papacy. Now, it couldn't exercise the authority for five more years till that third horn of the Goss was removed. But brothers and sisters, these dates, 330, 496 to 508, 533. This is part of the, the history that we should understand. Because the papacy at the end of the world in Revelation 17, the papacy is seated upon many waters. It's seated upon the beast. It's seated upon the seven-hilled city. It's seated upon the kings of the earth. The power at the end of the world that is seated is the papacy. The power that gives its military strength to the papacy in Bible prophecy is the United States. And the power that gives its civil authority over the papacy is the United Nations. And, correctly understood, this is the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon power at the end of the world. And these three histories of how pagan Rome surrendered itself into the hands of the papacy is current events. It's current events today. And the only way we understand these current events is if we understand this history that the pioneers understood so well that has been sealed up to us because of custom and tradition that we've accepted generation after generation. But this relationship between paganism and papalism is the subject of prophecy. Next page. The classic place in Bible in the Bible that identifies the papacy is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a serious passage of Scripture. This is Paul 
It says, let no man deceive you by any means. What's his first warning here? Don't be deceived on this subject. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. Who's the man of sin? It's the papacy. He's talking about when the papacy appears, when it is revealed. The son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? Paul's saying, look, I stood before you and told you these things. I don't want to go over them again. I'm writing in a letter. I can't, I can't send the details in a letter because if the letter gets intercepted by Rome, heads will roll. So just remember what I told you about pagan Rome. That's what he's saying, and that was the circumstances. He says, I told you these things when I was standing before you, so remember those things. And then he says this, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. He's talking about when the papacy comes on the scene of history, and he says there's a power that is withholding the papacy from taking the throne of the earth. For the mystery of iniquity, this is the papacy, doth already work, even in the time period of Paul, the beginnings of Catholicism and the Vatican and the papacy were underway. And, they, and Paul knew it was going to take control of the world. He knew it 500 years before it happened. It was already at work. It says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth. This word letteth, a better translation from the Greek is restraineth. He who restraineth the papacy. Only he who now restraineth the papacy will restraineth until he be taken out of the way. William Miller was looking for a power that would be taken out of the way in order for the papacy to take its place when he was studying the daily in the book of Daniel. And when he came about across this verse, he says, Glory to God! I now understand what the daily is. It's the power that has to be taken out of the way before the papacy appears. It's paganism. This passage here in 2 Th Thessalonians is talking about the relationship between paganism and papalism. Standard understanding in the Protestant world and in Adventism. This is the classic description of the papacy. And there was a time when every Protestant church understood that the papacy was the man of sin, even if they don't any longer. This is a heritage that Adventism, this understanding that we're giving you here is a heritage that Adventism received from the Protestant world. This isn't something that William Miller cooked up on, all on his own. Now, William Miller understood this to define the daily, but still, the Protestant world knew this was dealing with the relationship of pagan Rome and the papacy. It says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now restraineth, letteth, will continue to restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then, that, and then shall that wicked be revealed, the papacy, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy it with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Brothers and sisters, this is present truth. This part of the verse is serious. You need to understand this part of the verse correctly. There's people that are going to be destroyed. They're going to perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. He starts by saying, don't be deceived. And he's ending describing a group of people that are going to receive strong delusion. And he says that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. These people that receive strong delusion, do you know who Sister White says they are? Primarily, they're Seventh-day Adventists. That's the primary application of this in the spirit of prophecy. So I ask you what? What is the truth that they will not receive that brings the strong delusion? Is it the state of the dead? Is it the Sabbath? Is it the health message? The truth that isn't received is the prophetic truth about the relationship of pagan Rome and papal Rome. That's how serious this history is. If you're not going to get straight on the relationship of pagan Rome and papal Rome in Bible prophecy, you're only not going to get straight because you don't love the truth. And you're going to receive strong delusion. That's what this passage is saying. 
Now, you may not buy that, but that's the context of the passage. There are two phases of Rome in Bible prophecy. Pagan Rome, Papal Rome. Daniel deals with them in each of his prophecies. Daniel 2, two iron legs. Pioneers do not believe that the two iron legs on, in Daniel 2 represent the two phases of Rome. Uriah Smith, in his book, opposes that idea. But Uriah Smith is wrong. The pioneers in Uriah Smith said the ten toes in Daniel 2 represent the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome. He, he, the pioneers in Uriah Smith say those ten toes correspond to Daniel 7. And, and pagan Rome in Daniel 7 disintegrates into ten kingdoms. Brothers and sisters, read Daniel 2. It says in the days of these kings, in Daniel 2, these ten toes, after it talks about the ten toes, it says, and the, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that, that shall not pass. Paraphrase. When were the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome in existence? You know, from, by 538, we know it was down to seven. So it's before 538. Did God set up his kingdoms? In that time period? No, he didn't. There's only two places that you can point to in Scripture where you can say God sets up his kingdom here. You could make an argument that his kingdom set up at the second coming of Christ. You can make an argument that he receives his kingdom on October 22, 1844. But the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome by 1844 are ancient history, a thousand years, over a thousand years before that time period. That's why Sister White says that these ten toes, she says we've now come to the time when the iron and clay in the image is represented by churchcraft and statecraft. She places the ten toes at the end of the world. And if the two shoulders can represent the Medes and the Persians, the two legs can certainly represent the two phases of Rome, especially when the Bible says, upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. And in Daniel 7, pagan Rome is called the diverse kingdom. It's diverse than the kingdoms that came before it, pagan Rome. And when the papacy, the little horn, comes into Daniel 7, it's, called, it, it's, it's stated that it is diverse than the first king before it. In Daniel 7, pagan Rome is the diverse kingdom. The papacy is the di diverse king. So in Daniel 7, you have both phases of Rome, the diverse kingdom, the diverse king. In Daniel 8, verse 9, you have the little horn that the pioneers correctly identify is both phases of Rome. In Daniel 2, both phases of Rome in the two legs. Daniel 7, both phases of Rome in the two diverse kings. Daniel 8, both phases of Rome in the little horn. Daniel 11, both phases of Rome in the king of the north. Daniel always portrays both phases of Rome. Once you start seeing this, you recognize that the relationship between pagan and papal Rome this is one of the primary subjects of prophecy. One of the primary subjects of prophecy. There are two desolating powers, according to the pioneer understanding. The first desolating power was the daily desolating power. We're now getting into the subject where there needs to be some discussion. And the transgression of desolation, or in verse 31 of Daniel 11 and verse 11 of Daniel 12, it's the daily and the abomination of desolation. The pioneers, everyone believes that the transgression of desolation and the abomination of desolation are both symbols of the papacy. The pioneers correctly believed that the daily, in all three of these verses, represented paganism's desolating power. There's an argument about the daily in Adventism. We'll pick that up in a moment. The desolating, what it meant that they were desolating powers is that they were going to trample down God's sanctuary and his people in the Bible. You cannot separate God's people from God's sanctuary. They're, they're, they're just not separated in the Bible. The sanctuary is, was created so God could dwell among his people. They're inseparable. And these two desolating powers, the pagan desolating power, the papal desolating power, Bible prophecy says that they would trample down God's sanctuary, his people. Uh, you can see this in Daniel 7, the treading down. Um, in Daniel 926, it says, after three score, this is the top of page 75, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall de destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
who's the prince that comes and destroys the city and the sanctuary immediately after the crucifixion of Christ in prophetic terms? Pagan Rome. A.D. 66 to A.D. 70, pagan Rome came, surrounded the city of Jerusalem, and wiped it out in fulfillment of a time prophecy, or not in fulfillment of a prophecy in Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, Moses says, if you will be obedient to the covenant, I will bless you. That's what the Lord says. And then Moses says, but if you're going to be disobedient to covenant, I'm going to send a nation from afar who speaks a language that you don't understand, a fierce nation, and they're going to trample down your sanctuary and carry you into captivity. And pagan Rome destroying that sanctuary in that time period was a fulfillment not only of this verse, but of the promise of Moses. But notice, this it's going to trample down the... The city and the sanctuary, it's going to desolate that. And then what's it say? And the end of the war shall be with the flood. When did the flood take place? When did the flood take place? If you go to Revelation 12. The destruction of the, the sanctuary in AD 70 comes after Christ is crucified. And in Revelation 12, Christ is crucified Roughly in verse 5. In verse 5, it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. This is Christ. When was, God, when was Christ caught up to God's throne? At the ascension, after the cross, he went and began his work as the high priest, correct? That's verse 5. That's roughly that history. And then what's it say? And the woman, what's the woman? Christian church, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred threescore days. This is twelve hundred and sixty years of papal rule, right? And there's war in heaven. It talks about in the next few verses. But if you go to um, verse thirteen, it says, "And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child." And to the woman were given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she was nourished for a time, times, half a time from the face of the serpent, the 1260 years. And the serpent, who is Satan, cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. When did he cast out the flood? Water, Satan. During the 1260 years. During the 1260 years. That's what it says. So if you go back to verse 24 of Daniel 9, it's talking about the destruction of the sanctuary and the host. It says, And the prince of, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. This is talking about both phases, pagan and papal Rome persecuting God's people. And unto the end of the word, roar, desolations are determined. And the pioneers took this verse, and they say, Look at these desolations are plural. The daily... And the transgression or abomination of the desolation are two desolating powers, not one. Two desolating powers. Um, 2,300 years deals with the trampling down. AD 70 um, is identified in Revelation. The Dark Ages we looked at in Revelation. Oh, what, how much time we have? Six minutes. Let's do this real quickly. Um, just to bring this to a conclusion, we are putting certain place, things in place, hopefully. What's the longest time prophecy in the Bible? Normally, Seventh-day Adventists say 2,300 years. But it's a 2520. Mr. White says this, this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. William Miller believed that when Judah, the southern kingdom, was carried captivity, and why was it carried into captivity? Because it broke the covenant. That was the reason. William Miller says Judah was carried into captivity in, in the year 677, and if you take the time prophecy of 2520 and add it to 677, you come to 1843, and William Miller was seeing 1843 in everything. 1843 here, 1843 here, 1843 here, 1843 here. But William Miller was wrong. Israel was punished for breaking the covenant. Their punishment began when the northern kingdom was taken into captivity. And the northern kingdom was taken into captivity first. You can find that in 2 Kings chapter 17. When Israel, the northern kingdom, was carried into captivity. And if you have ushers 
James Usher's chronology of the Bible, which is the chronology that Sister White most often used and the chronology that the people that put the dates in the King James Bible use, you'll find that 2 Kings chapter 7 was the year 723. And if you start the punishment for the breaking of the covenant in 723 and add 2520, you don't come to 1843. You come to 1798. Now, what am I talking about this, the 2520? Leviticus, you have it in your notes. Chapter 26, verse 18, identifies that seven times punishments would be brought up on Israel for breaking the covenant. Verse 21 says the same thing. Verse 24 says the same, says the same thing. And so does verse 28. There's four times in Leviticus 26 where it's prophesied that 2,520 years, seven times, seven years, a year is 360, seven times 360 is 2,520, that 2,500 years would be punishment on Israel for breaking the covenant. It began in 723, and if you go 2,500 years, you come to 1798, but if you divide 2520 in half, it comes to 1260. So the middle of this time prophecy is the year 538, and aha, you suddenly see that the punishment of Israel, when it would be trampled down, the sanctuary and the host, come in two phases. Literal paganism was going to trample down literal Israel for 1260 years. And then spiritual paganism, the papacy, was going to trample down spiritual Israel for 1260 years. What the pioneers said about the daily and the abomination of desolation is spot on, as they say in England. And you see that this is the reference um, that... The Millerites used Leviticus 26. They also used the seven times of Nebuchadnezzar. And they did not use Daniel chapter 5. But they could have. Because many, many, Tekel, Eupharsin, were coins and weights. And uh, those weights add up to 2520. And the message connected to many, many Tekel, your farson, um, end of the day, but we know that message. Your kingdom is weighed in the balance and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and numbered. And brothers and sisters, there's three places in the scripture where this 2,520-day prophecy is identified. It's the curse against ancient Israel for breaking the covenant, the curse that Daniel was praying about identifying that he understood this curse had come on Israel in Daniel chapter 9. And within this time prophecy, you see the power that was to desolate Israel for its disobedience came in two phases, pagan and papal. Not an accident. Daniel, Revelation, portray two phrases of papal power. We'll take this a little bit further in our next presentation. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, um, as we come to the end of the day, we know that we've been listening to much information and it's hard to take in so many thoughts, so many ideas. We ask that you would bless, continue to give us a, a fresh mind where we can follow these thoughts and where we can see the relevance and the connection here with the end of the world, that we might be motivated and inspired to bring us, bring ourselves into alignment with this message through the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the time we've had here this Sabbath day. Uh, we see that it, the sun's um, going down, and we, we want to acknowledge that you have blessed us this Sabbath day. We thank you for it, and we ask you to continue to be with us as we close up this day in further studies. In Jesus' name, amen.